if you spend any time analyzing geopolitics, then it's inevitable that you'll come across the aphorism, one man's terrorist is another's freedom fighter. Though overused and often misapplied, there is certainly truth to the idea, and just because it's a cliché doesn't mean it's wrong. At least, not all of the time. But though we're all familiar with the idea that the distinction between a terrorist and a freedom fighter might not always be so clear-cut, it's equally important to consider the natural corollary to the idea that a king or general perceived by one man as a glorious conqueror would be seen by those he conquered as the manifestation of evil and wickedness incarnate. Just as we must critique the narratives advanced by the powerful regarding those engaged in armed resistance against them, we must also be willing to interrogate the stories that the powerful tell about themselves. Few conquerors in history have been as successful at shaping the perceptions of their actions as Julius Caesar. Not only was his conquest of Gaul remarkable for the military genius he displayed at every step of the decade-long war, it also serves as the gold standard in wartime public relations, with Caesar's commentaries shaping public perception in Rome to rally support for his actions, and still rallying historians to his side 2,000 years later. If you've seen our previous content, you know that we're quite sympathetic to the man. But even that has limits. Throughout the commentaries, Caesar is at pains to represent the war as justified, and his conduct as exemplary of the best aspects of Roman martial traditions. While he does not shy away from depicting actions that we would today characterize as war crimes, Everything he details in the commentaries would not just have been accepted by the Romans, it would have been celebrated. This presents a fundamental challenge to us moderns. How exactly should we approach figures of history who acted within the confines of their own cultural norms, but in a way that is at odds with our current beliefs and practices? The task appears daunting, and at first glance it feels like this would foreclose any judgment on the actions of the past. But any serious reflection on this more agnostic approach reveals that instead of being sophisticated, refusing to assign moral judgments to the past is actually myopic and removes humanity from the telling of history. There is a moral dimension to the historian's work that cannot be neglected. Otherwise, we're simply memorizing dates and locations, powerless to actually use the insights we gain from our work to improve lives in the present. Furthermore, if we aren't able to criticize the slave society of the Romans, then we defang attempts to criticize the slave society of the antebellum southern United States. If condemnations of Roman imperialism are off the table, then we are on shakier ground when we condemn British imperialism. That being said, these questions must be approached with care. Our world is fundamentally different in every respect, and as welcome as they are, Modern morals that espouse the fundamental equality of all persons are a relatively new phenomenon, and unfortunately, still have a ways to go. So while historical moral relativism is an outright untenable position, its antithesis, the idea of a fixed universal moral code, is still very difficult to defend. But the seemingly inevitable dilemma between these positions is a false choice. In fact, we don't even need to insert ourselves into the equation at all. This is because believing that the chief critics of Caesar's behavior are smug modern moralists is only possible if you've already bought into Caesar's propaganda. His war in Gaul had critics even in Rome, and it should come as no surprise that the Gauls themselves were appalled by his actions. It is worth dwelling on this often overlooked point for a moment because any effort to present Caesar's war as in keeping with the supposed standards of the day is nothing more than a glaring admission that the speaker implicitly believes the Gauls have nothing to say about a genocidal war waged against them in their own homeland. It's a trick often employed by those who seek to deny the horror of past atrocities by claiming that the offenders were simply behaving in a manner that was acceptable at the time. Acceptable to whom, exactly? Certainly not a widowed Gallic mother condemned to slavery and watching her only living child sold to a different Roman master than herself. There were millions of profoundly heartbreaking human tragedies which punctuated Caesar's years in Gaul, and pretending that since one side found them acceptable, we are forced to render no judgment, is an ideological straitjacket of our own devising that serves no one. 
This neglect of the basic humanity of the Gauls is indicative of a widespread phenomenon in the study of history, a tendency to side with the victors. It may be more fun to root for the underdog when it comes to sports, but when the outcome of a war has been known for 2,000 years, it's easier to let a teleological bias creep in that implicitly acknowledges the necessity of all past outcomes to create the world we exist in today, as if any other were impossible. This elevates us from observers of history to a mistaken belief that it was all a process designed to produce our world, and makes us willing to forgo judgment on actions from the past that we would condemn without hesitation today. But though we lack sources which provide the Gallic perspective, it's obvious that millions of them were opposed to Caesar's War of Conquest, as they engaged in open armed resistance for nearly a decade. Caesar himself acknowledged the bravery and nobility of his Gallic foes, and even admitted that they were justified in opposing him, when he states in the commentaries that, All men long for freedom, by nature, and despise the condition of servitude. Caesar knew what the stakes were, and so did the Gauls, and by Caesar's own estimation his war resulted in one million dead Gauls, with another one million destined for a life of brutal slavery in Rome. But as another popular aphorism states, one death is a tragedy, a million deaths is a statistic. This is even more true when we confront mass death that is thousands of years removed from us. So let us take a step back from the daunting figures that make it more difficult to grasp the human sorrow and misery created by the war and investigate specific incidents of Caesar's unparalleled brutality and inhumanity. As we do so, remember, that all of the following episodes come directly from the pen of Caesar himself. These are not Gallic sources exaggerating the scale of death and destruction in a bid for sympathy. All of the following are relayed matter-of-factly in Caesar's own commentaries. The Gallic Wars began in 58 BCE with the attempted migration of the Helveti tribe from modern Switzerland into what is now southern France and through the territory of the Roman-aligned Edui tribe. The Helvetii were desperate, fleeing aggressive German tribes that had ravaged their lands, and had no homes to return to as they had burnt their own villages before embarking on their exodus. Sensing a perfect casus belli for a war that would encompass all Gaul, Caesar denied the passage and goaded them into attacking his position. His disciplined legions routed the Helvetii warriors after hours of fighting, and then, eager for plunder and slaves, fell upon the baggage train where civilians were gathered. In one bloody day, the Helvetii had been reduced from 350,000 souls to approximately 110,000 survivors. The war was just begun, and already 240,000 Gauls were either dead or enslaved. The war that had begun on this flimsy pretext would soon spread outside the confines of Gaul itself, with Caesar taking the war to the far northern frontier to confront the Belgian Nervi tribe at the Battle of the Sabis River in 57. Out of a force of 60,000 arrayed against him, Caesar would devastate the enemy so thoroughly that he claimed he had nearly annihilated the entire population and name of the Nervii. This was no empty boast of a propagandist. After the battle, only 500 men capable of bearing arms remained in the tribe, and its council of leading chieftains had been reduced from 600 to just three men. Another Belgic tribe, the Atuatusi, would receive even harsher treatment after Caesar perceived that they had reneged on a peace treaty. To punish this tribe, Caesar had all 53,000 of them sold into slavery making no exceptions for women, children, or the elderly. The following year, in 56, he subjected the Veneti to a similar punishment, publicly executing most prominent chieftains and selling the remainder of the tribe into slavery. The war in Gaul was just over two years old, and already three tribes had been erased from existence, and the fabric of Gaul altered forever. However, this harsh warfare had the desired effect, and organized resistance began to falter. But Caesar was not content to be known merely as the conqueror of Gaul. 
He used the lull in fighting in 55 to organize a campaign in Germania and Britain, again on very flimsy pretexts. Caesar crossed the Rhine to halt the migration of the German Usipite and Tectari tribes, falling upon the undefended columns of civilians and scattering them before he dispatched his cavalry to hunt down as many migrants as they could. By Caesar's own count, 430,000 defenseless German migrants were slain by his cavalry or drowned as they tried to swim across the Rhine. Even if these numbers are inflated, it does not detract from the actions of the day, where Caesar openly admits to sending cavalry to cut down unarmed migrants. After years of Roman dominance, the Eburones tribe managed to dislodge a Roman garrison stationed in their territory, eliminating 15 elite legionary cohorts by luring them outside their fortifications during late 54. Caesar was camped far to the south when these isolated forces were destroyed, and his vengeance was swift, as nothing threatened his aura of invincibility, quite like a defeat of his legions, even if he himself was not present. Caesar decided to discourage any other tribe from rising against him as the Eburones had, by utterly destroying the tribe down to its last member. He deployed his forces to their territory and ordered that every village be systematically burned, along with all crops across the region. Anything living that was encountered by the legions was slain, including livestock. While Caesar knew that even his methodical troops could not personally kill every member of the tribe, he confidently states in the commentaries that anyone left alive would surely starve during the winter. I get chills reading this passage, and Caesar's utter indifference to the fates of thousands of men, women, and children that were doomed to a miserable end is a stark reminder of Roman attitudes. Remember that everything in the commentaries is there by Caesar's own volition, as he expected to be praised for these actions. Tragically, his quest to eliminate the Eburones would ultimately prove successful, and the tribe drops from recorded history after this campaign. If this does not constitute a genocide, then nothing does. Caesar waged war on an entire people, viewing all as equally guilty and equally culpable for the unforgivable crime of impeding his conquest. In 52, Caesar sought to make an example out of the Gallic stronghold of Avericum after a massacre of Roman merchants in a nearby town. The legions responded with wholesale slaughter of the entire population, not even taking captives to be sold into slavery. The city of 40,000 was reduced to a smoldering ruin, its citizens now nothing more than maimed corpses displayed in a grisly manner to ward off further Gallic resistance. Clearly, Rome was fighting to bring civilization to the Gallic hinterland, and thousands of impaled children were simply the price one must pay to receive enlightened Roman culture. Later in 52, Caesar's legions came head to head with the combined Gallic army of Vercingetorix at Elysia, an epic siege that would prove to be the decisive engagement of the war. With Elysia cut off from all supplies by the Romans, the Gauls expelled all non-combatants from the city to preserve food for the army massed inside. But the thousands of women, children, and elderly Gauls whose only crime was seeking refuge in the doomed fortress were turned back by the legions and were peppered with arrows whenever they ventured too close to the Roman lines. Vercingetorix was equally heartless and refused to allow them back into the fortress that had once offered the regions only safe haven from the marauding Romans. Caught between the walls of the warring factions, the Gauls begged the Romans to take them in, even as slaves, but they were forcefully turned back time and time again. I can imagine few things more harrowing than the wails of thousands of children slowly starving to death in a desolate no-man's land between two armed camps. But evidently, Caesar felt that the untold suffering was justified as a weapon of psychological warfare to demoralize the defenders of Elysia. We may be millennia removed from the ancient world, but episodes like this strike home with precise clarity in my mind. This horrifying scene and the painful deaths of thousands of innocents 
were not collateral damage, but the intended result of choices made by Caesar himself. I struggle in my very bones to understand how anyone who has children could do anything but condemn Caesar's actions here. One year after the tragedy at Elysia, Uxula Dunham would be the final major engagement of Caesar's war of conquest, and here he adopted a different tactic. Instead of killing or enslaving those who occupied the final outpost of free Gaul, Caesar decided on a more horrifying way to send a message. He had the hands cut off all men in the city, and then promptly sent them back to their homes as a living testament to the danger that came with continued defiance to Rome. A chill-inducing punishment, even today, this would have been more frightening in an ancient world that had no real safety net for the disabled beyond family and kin. In the ensuing years, many of these men likely starved to death, as the burden they placed on their communities would have been too great. The war was over. Rome was not loved, but she was feared. The Romans had made a desert, and they called it peace. We all know that in the end, Gaul was ultimately integrated into Rome's provincial holdings. In the generations that followed, Rome made successful inroads with elites, deputizing them to hold the territory in the name of the empire and convincing them to adopt aspects of Roman culture. These chieftains would never be sovereign as their ancestors had been, but the promise of greater riches won out over their desire for independence. For many, the history of Gaul stops at this point. Even those opposed to the actions I just described lose sight of the brutal war and feel that in the end the suffering of millions of Gauls was not in vain since it allowed their descendants to rise to the heights of Roman Enlightenment. But this is a skewed vantage point, for history never ends, and Rome was not eternal. The empire fell, and half a millennium after Gaul was conquered, the territory was again fragmented and governing itself. Was the untold human suffering inflicted by Caesar's legions justified to obtain 500 years of togas, wine, and Latin literature? If you're tempted to answer yes, just remember that you're doing so with someone else's life and someone else's suffering. I get the feeling that if I offered you a deal where an invading army would pillage your hometown and sell your family into slavery, but that in return your geographic region would later enjoy several centuries of economic prosperity under its new foreign masters, that you might not be too interested in that particular bargain. Hi, this is Titus from Tribunet. If you enjoyed the video you just saw by Gaius, and if you're interested in thoughtful content that explores the complex culture of the ancient Romans, don't forget to hit like and subscribe.